I, wanted, I thought one way of opening the conversation would just be to clarify the question I think that Andy Cannon had raised about um, uh, parallels with the present moment and, and so on and what Van Hildebrand might say uh, in regard to uh, the challenges we face today. And I wanted so much to emphasize the, the, um, the, uh, the fact that, it's, that, that it is perhaps a mistake to try to predict what particularly great and original minds and, um, and, and ultimately a truth-seeking person like Van Hildebrand would say. <clears throat> Um, I think it's, uh, it doesn't even allow us to be fully challenged by, uh, by his position. I, find, I, I certainly find in reading his memoirs and his essays that they, they don't just make me feel good about the way I already am. They generally make me feel like I'm falling short. And so it's in that spirit that I, that I um, try to sort of dif diminish some of those, those comparisons. But at the same time, I, I, I want to assure you all that, that von Hildebrand would be uh, the most outspoken voice imaginable on all the issues that that come to mind when we think about the, the, the crises we face today, whether it be marriage or abortion or religious liberty. Um, Alice Van Hildebrand tells the story that his very last talk in maybe 1976, I think it was in 76, was in Orange County, California, and it was, uh, maybe it was even earlier, it was somewhat earlier, it was right after, it was in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade, and he said something along the lines of what Mother Teresa would later say, that a nation that kills its own children is a, is a nation without hope. And those were his last public words, in fact. He, he as a very, very old um, and frail man, he stepped down from the podium, and that was the last thing he ever said to a public audience. And he said it with all of the, the fervor with which he writes in, in My Battle Against Hitler. So I just want to... Uh, if I gave in any way the impression of uh, uh, somehow uh, like, you know, that he was willing to combat the ultimate evil of Nazism and then he would have been soft for reasons um, um, uh, that I can't even imagine, that, that would be a complete uh, misrepresentation. So that's maybe, maybe the first thing uh, I wanted to say. But then uh, the part two to this is just to say that my, my uh, in general I think that even based on what he, what he says in his fight against Nazism, there would be, I'm not so sure he would be completely comfortable or completely at home with, for example, the close identification of, um, of conservative uh, moral principles and ideals with, the, um, uh, you know, with, with conservative republicanism. That's not to say he would run off to be a Democrat, but I don't know whether he'd be so quick to um, uh, to be comfortable with that. And, I, and, and one way of, of, of showing this is that he, he was very um, capable of, of making sort of alliances, as Rocco likes to say, uh, with all sorts of people. When, for example, he was in, in Vienna, he, um, he found that some of his allies were sort of left-leaning um, Christian figures, people in the, um, the, the circle of Winter, uh, who was a mayor there, in, in a very serious Catholic, but a left-leaning Catholic. I think his slogan was, um, Think left, stand right, was that perhaps his slogan? So von Hildebrand was willing to work with people on an issue if they took the right position in his mind. And then on the other hand, for example, in, um, in Vienna, at the University of Vienna, his, uh, all of his Catholic colleagues were, were national socialists, so that wasn't very helpful. And, and yet his one ally was Moritz Schlick, uh, a logical positivist philosopher and atheist, uh, with whom von Hildebrand, von Hildebrand even says, I thought of his philosophy as dangerous. But at this moment, the real parting of spirits lay in the stance towards National Socialism. So uh, Van Hildebrand was always a man of the essential, and he would um, focus on the issues that he thought were important and take stances towards them and then make his alliances. Um, at a much more mundane level, and then maybe I'll, I'll leave it with this, um, he, he, he describes, for example, um, sort of relationships that had been a little chilly with certain Thomists that he had known as a, as, a, as a philosopher, where that was the real barrier, but who in turn became outspoken opponents of National Socialism. And he said that, uh, that those differences could legitimately be set aside. They were not insignificant, but there was a hierarchy of importance. And at that moment, the, uh, the stance towards National Socialism was all that mattered. So he had all sorts of interesting friendships and alliances that grew out of this sense of the hierarchy of importance uh, to which he gave himself. So that's maybe my first observation. 
Well, listening to uh, the really brilliant exposition of John Henry, I was thinking of analogies to our time. Uh, I think that the first analogy we should uh, draw is that um, um, there is a spirit of the time. That is, uh, reality arrives to us through a system of social roles, of codified expressions, of uh, um, propositions that are generally accepted. And we are inclined to take them for granted. And they are linked to important social interests so that they create an atmosphere. And our thought is shaped through this atmosphere. This is what I would call the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist. And um, uh, many are inclined to think that uh, uh, we cannot transcend the spirit of the time. Also in Schiller, there is the danger of, um, Schiller is sometimes contradictory. The only expert on Schiller here is Professor Crosby. But I, I see sometimes a, a certain tendency to accept this. But we all do accept this, because we all live in a time that has its own spirit. And, is, and in this spirit, there is a certain set of propositions that are taken for granted. And uh, uh, this reformism gives us an example, on the one hand, of the force of the spirit of the time, but on the other end, of the fact that man, through the help of God, can break the chains, the shambles of the spirit of the time and can see truths that the spirit of the time does not see. That a Jew is a second-class man, and perhaps no man at all, was not a, an absurdity, an evidence of the spirit of the time. As well, the fact that uh, uh, sex has no importance for marriage seems to be uh, a, a, an accepted uh, uh, evidence of our own time. Nevertheless, it is possible to break the limits of the spirit of the time. And the task of the philosopher is exactly that, of not remaining prisoner of the spirit of the time, and of uh, helping society at large uh, to go beyond one formulation of the spirit of the time. You never reach objective truth in itself. You always, when you um, overcome the limits of the spirit of a time, you create a new spirit of the time that will have other, uh, other limits. And it will be always the task of, of, of the following generation of philosophers to go beyond the limits of this new spirit of the time. But it is important because here there is a, a parallel also to the opposition of uh, von Hildebrand to the spirit of the time in uh, the 70s, um, when many thought the council is the reformulation of Christianity within the spirit of our time. And uh, I can imagine that to von Hildebrand this was a kind of blasphemy, because in his own life he had already seen a spirit of the time. And many Catholics who said we must reformulate uh, our faith within the spirit of the time, reconciling the, the faith with the spirit of the time. In Protestantism, I beg the pardon of the Protestant minority present, this was even much more accentuated with the, 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 the Protestant uh, German church that was a Nazi church, but also among the Catholics. Uh, the, and he had struggled against this, so I could not accept that today they come back and tell me in a different fashion, in a different context, that it is not worthwhile to discuss seriously these issues because they've already been resolved in the spirit of the time. The faith has the power to uh, go beyond. Uh, I always remember a beautiful sentence of Hansel von Balthasar, Gottes God spreads grenzen. The word of God breaks the shambles. Uh, and Gottes word shaft suku. The word of, all, of God creates the uh, future. So I was thinking that this, I don't know what he will say, what he <coughs> will say in our time. I know what you would not say. Do not conform yourself to the spirit of the time. This does not mean to refuse the spirit of the time. No, but consider critically the spirit of your time. Retain what is good and reject what is false.
Uh, I, I might just add one um, footnote to that, that when Hildebrand thought that Germans, uh, because of the legacy of Hegel in German thought, were particularly vulnerable to the spirit of the time because he said the typical German approach is to think that whatever is powerful in history, whatever has dynamism and is uh, forming a whole era, must be some expression of the world spirit, you know, the Hegelian divine spirit that inhabits world history. And therefore, uh, there's some, something divine going on in these uh, 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 world historical events. And von Hildebrand said, that's senseless mystification. We have to be willing to uh, uh, say the emperor has no clothes and that the spirit of the times for all its dynamism is not in the truth and isn't revealing anything from God, but is uh, uh, something to be resisted. But he often appeals to that Hegelian heritage as somehow contributing to the uh, awe that Germans have in the face of what has historical dynamism. Unfortunately, I ask myself today whether this is a defect of the German spirit or whether it has become a defect in general of uh, the Western spirit. I want to make two points, if I can. Um, first, springing out of what we heard this morning on uh, von Hildebrand, and especially on witness, one of the most important things to happen in the next year is that there be, let's put it this way, 20 million conversations a week around this country, as those of you who are here matched with others, speak out around the dinner table or wherever you are on this question of same-sex marriage. One way to change opinion very much neglected is word of mouth. And it takes a certain heroism just to speak up when you know that most people are not going to agree with you and when you know that some of them will think ill of you and some of them may insult you for what you say. But if we sm practice those small acts of courage in our own circles, you'd be amazed how that ripples out and what political effect it can have. Um, now, in just a few days, the Supreme Court is going to come down with a ruling. And if it rules that same-sex marriage is entitled to the same dignity as marriage between husband and wife, um, indissoluble and oriented toward children. Um, it will signify, among other things, that for the first time in American history, the highest voice of the nation on this particular thing, the Supreme Court, has chosen an anti-biblical position. Now, John Adams wrote that the American Constitution was framed for a biblical people and for no other. And that its nets, I'm paraphrasing now, would not be strong enough to contain the forces of um, passion and unreason. Um, so we are turning in a new direction in this country. It's really very important and very fundamental. Now, furthermore, if the Supreme Court rules in such a way as to suggest even that any opposition to this new spirit is bigotry, then we are all going to be open to lawsuits 
and our jobs are going to be attacked. If you're teaching in a public school, even if you're teaching in a Catholic school, if your opposition becomes visible in the press or something, there will be a campaign against you and to, to deprive you of your job. And this has already happened in several different places in the country. And it got no protection, the person involved got no protection from the Catholic bishop, let alone from his own school board at a Catholic school. You know, I think you have to be a bit concerned about the logic of this decision. And it will play out, uh, maybe over time, maybe all the weapons of attacking you will not be visible at first. But they will become visible and they will create precedents leading to another one. So what John Henry put before us this morning is not abstract. It may impinge upon our own lives and careers, the lives and fortunes, I almost said, echoing the Declaration of Independence. So uh, think seriously on it and recognize how important it's going to be to begin in small circles, even in our own families, I'll bet we will not get everybody to agree with us, and uh, to recognize how important it is to carry out this argument in letters, in correspondence, in friendships, in conversations. Um, that's not like attacking Nazism, but really in our world, those things are very potent married to television and um, other, in newspapers even, which bring it to the attention of television. So those are the two points I wanted to make. First of all, about the nature of witness on a small scale, one by one, uh, and the potency of that, especially when it's somewhat coordinated and mutually encouraged. Um, and then secondly, about the logic of declaring a new right based on what, from a biblical point of view, are false grounds, uh, no grounds, and uh, then secondly, the logic of that going a step further and to say anybody who denies that is a bigot. There's no reason to deny it. And then the third step will be there must be punishments uh, for this bigotry. So it's already happening in Canada. Um, you read the history of the last 10 years <clears throat> since their decision in 2005 and the number of uh, penalties imposed on Christian ministers and others. Uh, Christian ministers not being allowed to speak to this matter in the armed forces, chaplains <laughs> and so forth. And then the circles just move out. Anyway, there we are. This first point that you made about witness uh, and move uh, to the discussion to Contessa Mazanas. Uh, Dr. Crosby here has a comment on witness. Yeah, well, yeah, in um, Gentes, in, in uh, Gentesimus Annus, um, there is one passage that has always caught my attention and seems to me one of the most significant passages in the whole encyclical. It's in number 23, and it seems to me also an eminently personalist passage, and it has to do with witness. So. It's just the kind of thing that belongs to our seminar. And I'd like to um, just lay it in front of uh, Rocco Buttiglione um, and ask uh, him and Michael Novak to uh, comment on the passage. John Paul writes, the fall of this kind of block, the Eastern block or empire, was accomplished almost everywhere by means of peaceful protest, using only the weapons of truth and justice. While Marxism held that only by exacerbating social conflicts was it possible to resolve them through violent confrontation, the protests that led to the collapse of Marxism 
tenaciously insisted on trying every avenue of negotiation, dialogue, and witness to the truth, appealing to the conscience of the adversary, and seeking to reawaken in him a sense of shared dignity. And I'll just add this, what follows immediately. It seemed that the European order from World War II and sanctioned by the Yalta agreements could only be turned, overturned by another war. Instead, it has been overcome by the nonviolent commitment of people who, while always refusing to yield to the force of power, succeeded time after time in finding effective ways of bearing witness to the truth. This disarmed the adversary, since violence always needs to justify itself through deceit. So it seems to me that this witness of the Polish workers that he uh, here uh, is uh, calling our attention to represents a, a unique kind of personalist triumph, because this appeal to the conscience, this appeal to truth, uh, in such a way as to prevent what would otherwise be an outbreak of ug ugly violence. That is a, a certain triumph of the person. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that, that moral power, that um, uh, quite distinct from just military power that helped to bring down the communist empire, that, uh, uh, that catches the, uh, you might say, fires the moral imagination of John Paul uh, here. And so I uh, think that since it involves so much this theme of witness, it merits maybe a little more attention and that Rocco Buttiglione could uh, perhaps disclose more here uh, to me from this passage. And, and Michael Novak as well. Well, look, I think this passage has its roots in um, the terrible experience of the Second World War. Um, and uh, um, many people also in the time of Solidarność were in favor of armed struggle. I told some of you yesterday, I think, the terrible moments uh, after yeah. the, um, uh, the stitch strike of, uh, of uh, Jaruzelski, and everything was ready for the insurrection. And uh, he invited them not to make use of violence, to go through the path of uh, a witness to truth that does not make use of force. Uh, and um, this is a long story. It was the, here you have the legacy of Kalinin Wyszynski, the first man who uh, invented, let us say, a strategy of opposition to communist power that refused to comply with the, uh, the uh, the violence of the regime, refused to be intimidated, refused to say yes to the falseness that was propagated by the regime, but always refused also to challenge it on uh, the level, on the terrain of an, an armed confrontation. The first one was Wyszynski. He had a particular genius, in a political genius also, in seeing what was uh, the, the most that could be done in every moment, knowing that you lead a, a, a large people in which there are uh, millions and millions of family mothers and family fathers, and you must pretend that they give witness to truth, but you cannot expose their lives without adequate reasons. So here you can read this great history. And also the teaching of Gandhi. Um, uh, what you had read Gandhi, and uh, uh, he wanted one of his students to write a thesis on Gandhi, which he did not. But I did that for him because I gave this thesis to one of my house students. You remember Alfred? Oh, yeah. The thesis of Alfred. Uh, and Gandhi, but he quotes also Gandhi uh, uh, at least once, perhaps more, in uh, uh, Love and Responsibility. Now, Gandhi is not the apostle of nonviolence in the sense that is commonly understood. Um, uh, Gandhi says, you have to struggle against evil. To struggle against evil is a fundamental um, uh, human duty. Uh, uh, but struggle without making use of force. 
if you can. If you can't, better to make use of force than to, to yield to, uh, to, uh, to power. And, and here also you find here uh, the echo. For me, there is also the echo of a conversation that we have had once. Uh, he told me more or less what he wrote. Uh, and I told him, Holy Father, but communists have no conscience. <laughs> he laughed, uh, he smiled, uh, and he said, well, we shall see uh, what God's providence has in store for us. And God's providence had in store at least two communists who had a conscience. One was Gorbachev and the other one was Jaruzelski. When the moment of decisions came, they refused to make use of force. And this led to the collapse of the regime. So that is, of course, it is not easy. In order to adopt this strategy, you need a long education of the people. That's the reason why I have uh, remembered uh, uh, Kalina Vyshinsky. Without the long period in which Vyshinsky has been the great educator of the Polish people, uh, Solidarność would not have been possible. And the strategy of resistance without violence would not have been possible. Um, and you need also uh, uh, women and men who can devise a strategy uh, that is adequate to the task. Uh, and this, again, is, is not easy. Uh, but this can be done. This was done. I remember, at the time of uh, the Iraqi war, I went to the Holy Father and I told him, um, there is no way. We have to make war. And he said, well, you have the right to make war. But I ask, are you sure if we, who were defenseless, powerless, could find a strategy to win against such a tremendous armed power as the Soviet bloc? How is it possible that the West, so rich, so powerful, cannot find a strategy to lead the confrontation with Saddam without violence? because violence engenders violence, and the chain is infinite. Well, uh, that is what I wish to, to add on this point. The ability of Boitia, Archbishop mm -hmm. Cardinal, and then as uh, as Pope is the genius of exactly what Rocco said. Finding the tactics, the exact pointed tactics that caused the most pain to the other party, but without arousing insurrection. When John Paul II visited uh, Poland in 1979, and I don't know how many of you have seen the movie uh, Nine Days That Changed the World, is that it? Uh, if you haven't seen it, you really must. And it's fantastic to show to students. It is so vivid, and it's mostly footage of real events. Um, it's, it's just amazing. But I think Rocco described very well the long, slow process in which people need to be educated in this. And we need that in the United States. One problem that Christians have in the United States is they are too tolerant and too passive, too quietist, if you wish. And they don't like confrontation, even confrontations at the dinner table. And um, it, it's going to take a bit of work to persuade various elements of the church to find a new way of fighting, what is unprecedented in American history before. I, I, I like to call it, although it's not so good in public use, Christophobia. There is a real passion against Christ and all that he stands for. But by that I also include, and this is the reason it's hard to use publicly, one of the reasons, is 
It also includes the Jewish prophets and the Jewish witness. You know, when it comes to society and how Judaism and Christianity live vis-a-vis -vis the powers of the world, most of what Christians have learned comes from Judaism. Jesus was not founding a political movement after all, but a movement of the spirit. But one thing Christianity added that no one else added was the anti-totalitarian principle. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God's. That means Caesar doesn't have all the power. And don't give him any more uh, than he deserves. That's a powerful political principle. And it leads partly to the idea of checks and balances. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll deal with that uh, uh, tomorrow. But we are going to need that long, slow education in how to resist. And it would be very helpful if some witty, bright young people could come up with funny li little comebackers useful in conversation. Uh, that arrest everybody's attention and by their humor um, cause a common instinct to laugh and yet are disarming and not necessarily confrontational at all. Uh, but there are, I cannot think of any, but we need those. We need comebackers in conversation. For example, in the recent argument over these questions, the gay movement has again and again put forward the question, what would married people lose by allowing same-sex marriage to? What do they have to lose? What skin does it take off their nose? Well, there's, I don't know of a comebacker to that. That's crisp, and you can use just like that in a moment of debate. Do you? But we need some of that. We need to invent a language of resistance, if, if you follow my, my thinking. And the best resistance is humorous, when you can do it. It's disarming, and it makes the other side look absurd, but not in an embarrassing way, in, in a f funny, amusing way that makes people think about the other alternatives. We have to start working out those things. It'd be nice to have a, even one single article somewhere on four or five tactical moves at the dinner table <laughs> to, uh, to introduce into these arguments. And we're so passive. So, and then last point, the issue that John Henry raised in Quoting from that article against quietism is so relevant today. There are so many voices, even voices we wouldn't have expected to hear this from, who say, we've lost. We've lost the fight. Might as well not make those arguments. And some call this the Benedict option of just concentrating, we withdraw from politics and just build little powerful communities. Stanley Howard was on the Protestant side and uh, uh, Rod uh, Dreher and others on the Catholic side are making this argument. Um, what's his name at Notre Dame to uh, Deneen. Patrick Deneen is making this argument. More and more voices are being at quietism. Withdraw from politics. Withdraw from the social struggles. Concentrate on building the faith. Well, this is, on this point, Von Hildebrand was devastating. And uh, we need to have that argument in, in the United States, in American Catholicism and elsewhere. So we've got a lot of work to do.